السلام علیکم اینڈ ویلکم ٹو مائی یوٹیوب چینل آئی ایم ڈاکٹر عرفان احمد چودھری اینڈ آئی ایم کنسلٹنٹ آرتھوپیڈک سرجن سو ایز یو آل نو دیٹ آئی ہیو بین اپلوڈنگ ایم سی کیوز فار آرتھوپیڈک پارٹ ٹو ایگزام ادھر اٹس فار ایم ایس اور ایف سی پی ایس اور فار دا ڈی این بی ایگزام فار انڈین ریزیڈنٹ سو ناؤ آئی ایم ریزیومنگ دا آرتھوپیڈک ایم سی کیوز ٹیسٹ اینڈ Uh, the next module that we are going to cover is the trauma. I have divided trauma into four sections and the first section is general trauma. The next one would be the spine trauma and then upper limb trauma, lower limb trauma and the fifth test as well, the pediatrics trauma. Although I have uploaded the pediatric section. So what I'm going to discuss that I have made slight modifications in the upcoming test that I will tell you along with explanation that what topics they like to test in the exam. So as you know that the next exam is going to happen in April 2021. So let's start the test today. Uh, first of all, the topics that I have included in the general trauma, uh, this test, this includes the resuscitation, open fractures and their classifications, infections, compartment syndrome, and uh, we will be discussing from question to question to the first question as you can see on the screen that 25 year old man he presents with gastillo anderson 3b type tibial fracture after a motorcycle crash which of the following description matches this classification gastillo anderson type classification is the one which is being tested in the exam there are different things that in gastillo anderson classification you must remember in gastillo anderson classification it is not only based on the size of the wound or the ability to close it primarily or not it is based on energy of the trauma how much with how much energy the trauma size of the wound fracture combination and the pattern of the fracture periosteal stripping and um, other than this there's skin coverage neurovascular injury so there are different things that we must see whenever there is a question on gastillo anderson so if you go if you go through the uh, options distal tibial third uh, third tibial fracture with extensive soft tissue injury and a pale foot following adequate close reduction Posterolateral ankle fracture dislocation with 8 cm laceration on the medial ankle amenable to primary closure. So as we know that in 3B, it's not amenable to primary closure. And mid-shaft tibia fracture with 1 cm anterior laceration requiring compartment release intraoperatively. This also doesn't qualify. Proximal third tibial fracture with extensive soft tissue loss requiring gastrocnemius flap and closed pylon fracture that will require delayed surgical fixation after initial external fixation. So as we know that in 3B, there is a typical size of the wound that is more than 10 centimeters. It's high energy trauma, extensive communication can be present and periosteal stripping is present. And the most important thing that it requires free flap or the other thing is rotational flap. So the correct answer is D. Proximal third tibial fracture with extensive soft tissue loss requiring gastrocnemius flap. The next question, 36 year old male sustains an open segmental tibial fracture that is associated with an overlying 8 centimeter soft tissue avalion. That requires... Now the, there is a trick in this question and you have to identify it. That requires skin grafting for soft tissue coverage. No vascular injury is identified. What is the most appropriate gastillo anderson classification? So this question has a trick in it that we have used the word skin grafting. We have not used the word of flap. So this does not qualify for 3B. So the answer would be in this case, the answer is 3A because the graft that the word we have used was a trick. The next question, I think I must not uh, speak the question. You can read it yourself and then I'll explain what is the cause. Now, as you can look at the question, the patient is in GCS3. He's intubated and in the field following a motor vehicle accident. 
Now, the previous questions that I have discussed, these were about the Gustilo Anderson. And after these, there's a beautiful table in Orthobullets that describes what are the points that Gustilo Anderson classification have. And before answering the question, you must know what are these points. Now, the next question, this is about, this is about resuscitation in orthopedics. The patient has GCS3. He is intubated. Grade 4 liver and splenic laceration as well as open book fracture. Now, the patient came to you and you have resuscitation, resuscitated the patient. Now, the question is asked about the most important value in determining the overall resuscitation status. Well, resuscitation is assessed on different things. The things that are mentioned, there is heart rate, base excess, blood pressure, urine output. These are the values that are being used to assess that the patient has been adequately resuscitated. But the one thing that is most sensitive and most specific, that is serum lactate levels or base excess. If there is option of serum lactate levels or base excess, you will go for that. So the answer is D. This is a good question. The next question. This is also regarding your resuscitation or initial management. 25 year old male, he has a gun shoot, gunshot wound and the bullet is in the spinal canal on MRI. Entry of the bullet was through the abdominal wall. So the entry was anterior and it has caused the perforation of the gut. Patient is able to move his lower limbs with no apparent sensory loss. The treatment is, now you have to tell the treatment. Well, the, uh, the question, in this category, this is from the gunshot wounds. Gunshot wounds are have some basic principles to be managed, and then there are some different principles in femur fractures, in tibial fractures, and in spine as well. So the best possible answer in this status, in this question, would be, yes, you are right. The answer is E. Why E? Because the question is telling you that the bullet is in the spinal canal, but the patient is able to move his lower limbs with no apparent sensory loss. So the answer would be E. So when to remove the bullet from the spinal canal? That has different indications. But when not to remove, this is one of the indications. If it's not causing any sensory motor deficit along with not compressing on MRI. 65 year old man. Now the question is from amputations. You have to know the amputations, some complications of the amputations and uh, some prerequisite of specific amputations. 65 year old male, he underwent list frank amputation. You must know the level of list frank amputation, the prerequisite of list frank amputation, so the most common complication after Liz Frank, yes, you are right. It's equinovirus. The answer is, the answer is B, equinovirus, yes. Now the next question is also from amputations. 65 year old man wards amputation at mid tarsal level, but you have suggested him sim amputation. Now this question is very important because the sim amputation has some special features and the examiner likes to ask about time amputation. So what is true about time amputation? Basic uh, question theme is this. So the true thing is it is more energy efficient than mid tarsal amputation B. Although time amputation is proximal when compared to the mid tarsal amputation, but it is more energy efficient than the mid tarsal amputation. Now the next question is also from amputation after above knee amputation. Best possible thing to make prosthetic fitting better and improve the position of femur to allow more efficient ambulation. Well, after uh, above knee amputation or uh, more specifically uh, transfemoral amputation that we call now, uh, what is the best step to do to achieve these parameters? The answer is yes. The answer is D, adductor myodesis. Then comes the 45-year-old man underwent amputation. 
Energy expenditure while ambulating is 40% above the baseline after being fitted with an appropriate prosthetic prescription. What is the patient's most likely lower limb amputation level? So in lower limb amputation, after amputation, what is the effect on overall person uh, in terms of increased metabolic energy? So you have to memorize what is these percentages in Liz Frank, in transtibial, average transtibial, long transtibial, short transtibial, bilateral transtibial, transfemoral, through knee. So these all must be memorized and bilateral femoral. So the correct answer in this is bilateral transtibial. Uh, and if there would be, uh, would have uh, option of short transtibial, that is also 40%. Now coming on to 45 year old male, he underwent amputation. Which of the following lower extremity amputation requires a soft tissue balancing procedure to prevent deformity following amputation. So this is also an um, interesting as well as important question. So to the word has been used soft tissue balance. Also, it's just a denotomy of a tendon. And if you would have known that uh, after uh, which amputation we have issues of equinus, equinovirus, or some soft tissue imbalancing, then you would have known. So the best possible option is E, list frank, because there is equinovirus deformity as in the previous question we have discussed. Now coming on to compartment syndromes. Compartment syndrome is uh, mostly is tested, mostly tested in MCQs, in talks, and sometimes they like to ask in viva. So this is a very interesting question, and it will clear your concept. Thirty-five year old male, he sustained a closed tibial fracture after falling from twelve feet. Which of the following measurement would be concerning for an evolving compartment syndrome? Well, the compartment syndrome, when does it develop based on compartment pressure? So always remember one thing, delta P. Delta P is basically diastolic pressure minus compartment pressure. And if it is less than 30, one thing, if it is less than 30, then the compartment syndrome has developed to give you an example if you have the a patient with systolic pressure diastolic pressure 60 and his compartment pressure is 31 so means 60 minus 31 29 if he has less than 30 value of this delta p compartment pressure is developing the next thing to consider we do not routinely take the diastolic pressure intraoperatively. We take it preoperatively because intraoperatively, the diastolic pressure decreases after spinal or due to some anesthetic drugs. So it is not a reliable value. And this question is telling you both of these things. That wherever we have used the intraoperative word, we will exclude it from the answer. Uh, and uh, so the correct option is A. We have intraoperative anterior compartment 29 minus preoperative diastolic pressure of 58. So it comes to 29 that is less than 30. So whenever you have to use the value, it is delta P that is diastolic pressure minus compartment pressure. Diastolic pressure must be preoperative. But the compartment pressure can be pre-intraoperative. It doesn't make any difference. Then comes the next question. Uh, uh, you must know that I have written this book of surviving orthopedic MCQs. And you will find a lot of questions in this. Like this question I'm going to discuss. Variety of such questions has been tested by CPSP and university exams. And this book contains uh, almost all of these questions uh, that have been in the exam for the last seven years. So this question 
that we are going to discuss. 28 year old male, he sustains a mid shaft fibular fracture and he develops compartment syndrome isolated to the lateral compartment of the leg. So if left untreated, which of the following sensory deficit would be present? Now, every question, we make a story, but the bottom line of the question is one. So in this question, they are asking that if there is isolated lateral compartment syndrome, then what nerve would be affected? So the answer is superficial peroneal nerve. So what is the supply, sensory supply of the superficial peroneal nerve? So I have may uh, given pictures in my book as well. Superficial peroneal, deep peroneal nerve gives supply to the first web space. Superficial peroneal nerves, it gives the sensation to the dorsum of foot involving hallux and three other toes. Uh, third and fourth to the dorsum surface, not the plantar surface. So this is the right answer, A. And the nerve involved is superficial peroneal nerve. Now comes the, this question that if someone has developed compartment syndrome in the leg, then what is the optimal position that we will keep to decrease the pressure in the leg? What ankle position results in safest compartment pressure in a casted lower leg? So again, we have made a story, but the basics of this question is that in which, what, which typical position you will have, you will lower the intracompartment pressure in leg. So the correct answer is, yes, you're right. It's C, neutral to 30 degree of plantar flexion. If you dorsiflex the foot, it will increase the pressure. Now, that's all for the first test that I was uh, discussing with you. And now the next test will be on the topic of spine trauma and I'll be uploading it. So I will try to keep it short so that you can watch the video in few minutes and get an idea that at what level of uh, preparation you are at. And uh, apart from this, I'm going to upload uh, videos of Vivas uh, this season as well. And this will be in very interesting and like a real exam that I'm going to upload. Thank you so much. Just remember me in prayers and um, stay tuned. I'll be uploading my next videos as well. Inshallah.